This is what happened to Fedosiev in the last round. He had black as well, but against a 2600 rated player, Oparin. So not as formidable an opponent as Yakovenko. Full chances to win the tournament. And he played the Berlin. So you can see a different approach um, from Fedosiev. He seems more like he's trying to play for the draw is black. Um, or, you know, something solid. I mean, it can also be based on what strengths or weaknesses they think the different players have, you know, um, their opponents. And we get a delayed exchange, and this structure here we've been talking about a little bit in the last week or two with both the Rui Lopez and the queenside Rui Lopez. And we also talked about how rare it is for white to castle queenside in the Rui Lopez, but I thought this was a great example again, of a queenside castling Rui Lopez by white, um, similar to a, a really nice Caruana game from a year ago. So, um, yeah, you would think that the dark squared bishop trade, black would be happy about because white could be weak on the dark squares. I never know who wants to trade these bishops or not because on the one hand, black has the bishop pair, so you want to keep the bishop pair intact. If you trade it off, there goes your... There goes your compensation for the doubled pawns in a sense. But on the other hand, I like the idea of like trading it off and then putting like these three pawns on dark squares, right? So that's a critical strategic question that I actually don't know the answer to. And it's probably like, maybe it's basic knowledge. And, you know, Fidelsi have just played bishop d6 without thinking and that's what any grandmaster would do. And somehow I never heard about it. But I don't know for sure if black should be trading or retreating. Um, or, you know, should in general want to trade these bishops or not, right? If you're worried about f takes e3, you can also just leave your bishop on c5 and let white take there, right? You, I mean, I just because I want to trade doesn't mean I necessarily will trade on e3 because, as you know, I don't like to bring my opponent's pieces into better squares. But, you know, I could play a move like queen e7. I can see myself doing that, and now I'm trying to bring my pieces into better squares. But he's, like, deliberately, he's, like, avoiding this exchange. So he seems to be saying that the exchange is just, just no bueno, overall um and white plays a quick d4 and i think timing is important on d4 because if you continue developing black is liable to play c5 um nail down the d4 square now why is that such an important thing for black to do to play c5 i mean he's got the bishop pair why are you trying to keep the center close aren't you giving white outposts for their pieces when you fix the pawn structure well, I think the conversion from d4, essentially trading off the e5 pawn, it really reduces black's presence in the center a little bit and converts white's, um, and converts the nature of this doubled pawn weakness. Once you trade your d pawn for the e pawn, white has a healthy pawn majority on the king side that they can make use of by advancing it and playing on the king side. Um, as long as this pawn is on d3, it's not so obvious how to use your pawn structural advantage after black plays c5. I mean, frankly, black's the one with a semi-open file, which you don't have. Black's got plenty of space in the center. And, you know, what's your plan? Uh, there are plans. <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's just the attitude. Um, so, yeah. So I think um, critical to make this pawn structure change when possible for white, very desirable to play d4 in this exchange. Rui Lopez's. So black just castles again. Um, and now the trade happens eventually. Knight b6. Black would have preferred for white to take on e5 and bring out his knight, but uh, white obviously wasn't biting. So he trades on d4 to release the pressure on e5 and move the knight himself to get his bishop out. Now I had a game on Friday in one of the blitz segments where I ended up with this knight on b6 against this pawn structure. I traded dark squared bishops. Other than that, it was like this exact setup. And my opponent castled kingside and played f4. And then they surprised me with knight b3, knight c5, f5, and knight to e6 outposting. But one of the issues in that game was that my knight was always bad on the b6 square. So I'm curious to track in this game whether we think this knight on b6 is good or bad as we, as we play through it a little bit more. Now, um, Oparin played much more aggressively here as white by choosing to castle queenside really shaking up the game obviously possible as well to castle kingside it's this is not this is not a correct move wrong move situation this is a, a taste 
kind of thing. And there might be one move that's a little bit better, but both are definitely within the realm of plausible. Um, so castling queenside increases the sharpness and allows him to really like throw his G and H pawns as part of the strength of his kingside pawn majority. But it also means that black's crippled pawn majority um, might potentially advance and just like throw itself at white and try and open something up. And you might find uses for these for these pawns as well. So a5 comes right away. He stops it there. Always a question of on what square you want to you want to block that, or if you let it go all the way and play b3. All right, white has to be careful to keep control of the light squares because uh, he will tend to be weaker on them without the light squared bishop. So even though he wants to like go aggressive at some point, pushing everything, you see him taking a moment at first to restrain the c4 square. What do you guys think of this knight so far? To me, it's looking like bad. Like it can't go anywhere, and it's potentially stopping a b5, b4 plan. White's both like rushing and not rushing at the same time, right? It's hard to say. It's like he's like, I my plan is to just throw these pawns at you, but I'm going to do it a little bit carefully. And this is an original use of the rook, but I know from playing through this game before that it just doesn't work out. This does not end up helping black in any way, having some weird sideways influence from the rook on the fifth rank. Honestly, it just discoordinates the rooks from being defended with each other. All right, and white finally advances. Black just seems to not really have a plan here. Like, he's just sitting around. Um, you know, and what I would have wanted to do for black at some point would have been play c5 and b5. I guess if you don't have an alternate square for this knight, like, it's all well and good to want to play c5 and b5, but you can't. So, so instead of rook a5... <clears throat> What if we play the move c5? Let's see how bad that is. Knight f5, maybe. All right, now I get to improve my knight. Now, do you want to leave the knight here defending this and play f4 to, to take away the e5 square? Or do we even like go into black's weaknesses on this side of the board with queen b5 and knight c4? Or just play rook g1 and play bishop h6? So now it's like, yeah, you can have your knight on e5, congratulations, right? And then here and here, and you just start opening this up. So black's finally found like purchase for his uh, for his pieces in the center, but white's just so far along with his attack, and black hasn't played b5 before yet. Um, this definitely doesn't look good for black. <laughs> um, you know, I was also wondering about this, this, then surprise, trading here, here, and playing rook d1, and like this. Um, and I was also thinking about playing queen b5, and then knight c4, so that my queen is into these weaknesses after I get knight c4. But then they can probably play knight e5, and like give you this pawn, and play here, and here with counter play for black. And bishop e5 next move. Yeah, so probably bringing the queen into the queen side is kind of kind of underestimating black's ability to just sack pawns on the queen side because of the opposite side castles. So I don't like that approach. I think this knight c4 thing is fine. White has an edge, but 
it looks like just a simple rook g1 is the move that's actually the strongest, um, just using the g file right away. So that doesn't look amazing for black. In any case, what he does with rook a5 and bishop e5, this does not work out for him at all. Um, white comes up here. Black won't open the h file, but now there's the h pawn to assist white in his attacks later on the g file. And now this move, rook g1. And now it's too late for c5 because knight f5 has gotten even stronger. Um, right, white is just too prepared for this. Um, and trade and then bring the next one basically is the plan. And in this position, black's kind of bereft of counterplay because he's not doing anything. Yeah, the idea of rook a5... I mean, it's the move I highlighted as a move I didn't like. Um, so I couldn't give you the best explanation of what the of what the idea was behind rook a5 here. I mean, to somehow influence some of the squares here to maybe play c5 without allowing knight b5. But really, knight f5 is where white's probably going anyway to try and open up the g file based on black not being able to stand a knight sitting on f5 forever. Um, so... <laughs> I can't really say why they play rook a5. It just looks bad to me. I think they're better off just having the rooks connected and defending each other. Um, but it seems like this position is pretty low on counterplay for black. And honestly, like, let's say you could play b5 here, just through the knight. Then black might actually have a game, right? b5, rook g1, or h5, or g5, and then just b4. And black might actually be in the game, kind of. So it's this knight that's, like, really killing me. So I tried the c5 line. I suppose the other thing that I could try was, like, I was thinking about knight c8, trying to play for b5, b4. The unfortunate thing about this is, obviously, the knight's bad on c8, and now you don't have two rooks to double on the b file because the knight's in the way. But, I mean, at least it does something, so that might be better than, than what he did. I don't know. That might be the best move to just play b5 so frankly i would say this knight on b6 is again getting really poor marks i mean it could have been better on f8 maybe if we go back and ask how black should have developed his pieces um you could play rook to e8 here i think that's typically a good square for the rook and then white could castle kingside or queenside let's not worry about it too much and let's just put the knight here you know from here the knight covers some squares on the kingside vaguely obviously it's not super active but it's more out of the way than on b6. Um, works better with like a queenside pawn expansion at some point. So that could have been a whole different approach to the position much earlier on. Um, but once that's not done, white plays rook g1. Now he always has knight f5. Um, because, as I said, if the bishop takes, you're opening the g file and white cracks it and plays f5. Um, I didn't mention that if you accept the sacrifice, you get instantly mated by rook g8 here and here. But this is also a cool thing to be aware of. Um, yeah, knight d5 is a move. Black is um, black is about to play that clown pawn. Good catch. All right, so you guys see the checkmate here. And now let's get to what clown pawn is saying, which is that black can play knight d5 at some point, And then on pawn d5, queen e3. So that is like the big opportunity for black. He plays it next move. Let's see what would happen if he played it this move. I think what happens is white plays maybe knight c4. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Here, 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 and now knight c4. And you guys can see again why I'm blaming the move rook a5 so much, right? It's just like, why is your stupid rook on a5? Why? What's... If the rook were on a8, black would just play rook e4 in this position and they'd have a chance in the end game, right? If they didn't have a rook hanging on a5, it were just back on a8. Play rook, a, rook e4. And you're still in the game. But here, I mean, it's not even allowing you to use tactical operations because it's just a dangling rook on an exposed square. It's a bad tactical element, basically, right? And so he now retreats it with rook a6. And frankly, once again, wouldn't rook a8 be better? I mean, are you trying to overprotect the knight on b6? At some point, you just recognize that like rooks belong on the back rank supporting each other. And 
yeah, this ex this like cool excursion is kind of bad. There's this line of um. I'm just gonna open another board for you for a second, okay? If you'll bear with me. Okay, there's this line in the Scotch. This is like a super classic old line. It's the Scotch four knights. So you know Kasparov plays knight c6 and introduce this line with knight c6 and e5 into serious practice. But before that, this was the old scotch, and black would play bishop b4, attacking this square and trying to play d5. And then um, you can't play bishop d3 because of knight d4, so the main line goes da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da, castle, castle, d5, takes, takes, you know, something like this, this, whatever, whatever. I'm just making some moves just to give you a position, okay? Whatever, some position like this, right? You guys seen? You guys ever seen this kind of opening? Now, in this position here, I used to try and get like clever active with black. I would play rook to b8, getting them to play b3, and then I would try and activate the rook through b4, right? And just like, ooh, my rook's active, right? It's like controlling some unusual squares. I'm finding unusual maneuvers to like g4 or d4 or something like that, right? Well, I, I played this in like a number of um, Blitz games, and what I eventually found was that everything that my Rook was doing, every single thing I found to do with my Rook was less important than having one extra Rook defending E8 to back him up if the E file opened. You got me? All my like, ooh, it's unusual, ooh, it's active, oh, it's doing something. It was all wrong, okay? The best this Rook can do is keep an eye on the Rook on E8. That's it. That's your job. Okay, defend that rook, keep yourself from like losing to tactics on the E file, stay strong on the E file, and if you want to do something unusual, bring your queen out here. Your queen's more maneuverable and can make more annoyances to white. But, you know, if white plays rook takes rook, you don't want to put your queen on the file as much as you want to put the rook on the file. So keep the rooks connected, that's their job, is to secure the E file, and the queen can go do the funny business. That's a very important lesson I learned about this position. I promise you guys it's true. So anyone who plays this with white or with black, keep that in mind. Don't go doing this stupid active rook. So that reminds me of this rook on a5. He just needs to go home. The best you can do is back up your buddy. That's good enough. I know it doesn't look glorious. You're not attacking anything yourself. Back up the rook on e8. That's important work. The e file is like the key. It's like the only like counterplay black has is when white advances from f3 to f4 and starts going for the kill. You will have a brief moment as black where you have a chance to fight back on the e file. And, you know, he could potentially have had his chance right here, except for the rook on a5. And. Yeah, I mean, if white couldn't take, then, you know, knight f4, knight e3, this could actually be annoying. All right, so rook comes to a6, and now the final execution. Shall we see the execution, folks? Queen to d3, he plays knight d5, and now white just passes on by, allows the trade, and defends this square and ignores it. Black has to keep trying to fight on the e-file, right? You see how the e-file is the one source of of counterplay he really felt he had here and how it would be better to have this rook participating somewhat. So knight f5, hi, I've come to kill you. Um, if the queen retreats, then this bishop is defended and white can start winning material, I assume. Um, so, well, I suppose this is possible and fun for white. Chase this queen back here. And now you can go for checkmate again, right? Wee, checkmate. Oh no, my queen's blocked. What did I do? <laughs> All right, instead of that, how about we play something fancy? Oh no, because rook g8, there will be king f7, so I shouldn't get too fancy. I was gonna play bishop c5. Um. Okay, how about I do it with rooks and no queen? Just come here, play rook here, and then bring the second rook up to g7. That looks good enough to me. I'd be satisfied as white. So I think that is a nice example of a kill against black taking this piece. I suppose the king could also come this way. 
which we can also have the joy of, of destroying this variation. Queen here. It's tempting to like play e6, isn't it? Uh, Bishop takes, rook takes. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking of e6 now. Um, okay, so this is also a good way to play it. You play here, so the bishop's hanging and, and f6 is a problem and this diagonal's a problem. And let's say they take, now I want to play queen g3. Basically, I'm trying to win by just threatening rook to h7 check and queen here mate. But my queen's also helping me control e5, so that next move I could take on e5. So now queen f6 would be the one move I see that defends queen g7 mate and defends e5 against fe, potentially. And then I would go with the old triple. And now we're threatening rook g8, rook g8, queen g8. And you guys know why that would be checkmate? Does anybody know why that would be checkmate? Because of this moron who left a8. If he hadn't left a8, this again would not be a thing, right? So anyway, now he could come back and now we can play like a basic tactic if we want. Like this. Like this, if the rook takes, we've got mate, right? So queen here, and now rook g8, rook g8, and queen e5, right? Nice little basic tactic. You guys caught that. If rook here, this is checkmate. So, yeah, moron, moron. That rook just didn't know what rooks are supposed to do. But that's how you learn. My rooks used to be morons just like that. Exactly like that. That's why I noticed him. Because I used to have the same guys under my under my employ. Um, so, <clears throat> so in the game Knight F5 was played, we've now seen all the satisfactory ways, all the satisfaction we could have gotten if, if black took on F5 and we were white. Unfortunately, we didn't play this game. Um, Fedosiev plays bishop takes F5, Opar in GF5, opening his rook. Knight takes e3, and by now he's just not caring about anything. White has just calculated. This is like my favorite. This, for a long time, was my favorite part of chess. It might secretly still be my favorite part. Is like when you're destroying someone, and then you start calculating all the fun lines, like all the oh, I could have done this, and then I could have done that. Oh, I could have done this at the end, right? So like, how bad is it for Black if he takes on d1? Well, let's see. Knight check. Um, where should the king go? Maybe h6? h8 is safest, maybe? Pawn takes, threatens mate. So you gotta take it back. Now queen takes. This threatens queen g7. Queen g7, pawn takes g7, mate. That's why there's no time to save the knight or the bishop or anything. Right? It also threatens queen g8, rook g8, and rook g8. Now why would that be checkmate, guys? So, um, so here I would assume that Black's just mated, right? <laughs> I guess technically we're down a rook, which makes it sweeter. But like, there's just nothing for Black. I like that at the end we can we can get rid of our queen and like checkmate him with like a pawn or something. That's pretty nice. Um, if the king goes the other direction, you do the same thing. They can't allow g7, g8. So they might take, and then you bring in your queen, and now you're checkmating here. And so something like this might be the best that they can do. And here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And uh, we got back the rook. We're still down one piece, but... Again, what is this guy doing? We're just going to queen this pawn while he watches from a6. I don't know. Again, this whole variation that I just played would not work if this rook were on a8, right? I might even be losing. Who knows? So, 
Yeah. I think we've had our fun and we've learned something at the same time, right? With this this poor guy here. So, um, so knight takes e3, and in this position, instead of queen takes e3 or pawn takes g6, um, Oporin just plays like such a just oh move this is like the kind of thing you want to play like the reason that i played chess for years was just because i wanted to play a move that looked like 94 um just man the brutality of what's coming in here the knight comes here to defend knight f6 check and keep the extra piece sort of <laughs> and uh he takes back his extra piece this actually was like sweet as well that oparin saw that he could do it this way because ed6 if queen e4 which seems to just completely destroy white, right? Like black's up a knight. Now now black's got their counterplay on the E file through, right? Traded queens. Up a piece. No attack. All of this loses. Why? Because of the rook on A6. White has D7. D7 and it's over. Black can't keep these pieces defended, right? Queen D3 you take here. Checkmate. And if the rook moves um, here, you just take the queen for free. So the best thing that black can even do is put the rook on a8, finally, you know, and white goes up material here um, comfortably, comfortably winning this end game. So he's able to play e takes d6 again because this rook isn't here for the critical e file play. cd6. Now he goes here. And yeah, basically did all this fancy stuff to be down a pawn in an almost symmetrical position, except he's going to break through on this G file. This rook isn't in play and this king is safe. Um, yeah, so rook takes G6. And obviously if black doesn't do anything special, white will play queen G3, rook G7, H7, whatever. Um, so we get here. Still, the threat is just to play h7 and then either h8 or queen. Um, since the king can't move, this will just win instantly. Um, if this rook were on a8, black would still have a plausible defense in queen f7, which he didn't play. But what's wrong with queen f7 is queen takes, king takes, knight d6, king here, and rook takes. And again, with the rook on a8, this would not be as devastating. Um, you could trade rooks and take here. I guess you would probably still lose. And if you go king f8, you probably lose to rook takes, rook takes, knight takes, and if king takes, then h7. So I guess white has it sewn up at this point, but you can really see the agony of not having this piece defended, how important that is in so many tactics, so many variations. So f5 is played. I imagine the move h7 wins the game here as well. White played this and black resigned. Because um, this, this, this is coming. Sweet, sweet game by Oparin, right? And a good and a nice example of, um, of the Rui Lopez exchange structure. A nice example of a queenside castling in the Rui Lopez, which is rare. Um, but super sweet in this game. And that is how Fedosiev did not become Russian champion this this year, and uh, and Ryazantsev did.